Today, we have Paul Backer speaking uh, to us about law for technical communicators. Paul has 30 years of experience behind him as a technical communicator, trainer, and consultant, helping manufacturers across the world to craft instructions that keep them on the right side of the law. He's also used this experience uh, in his work as a university lecturer and as an expert witness in legal proceedings. Paul has also uh, previously served as Vice President of the ISTC, and we are very grateful to have him back today to share his experience and knowledge with us on this important topic. Um, so, Paul, if I can, I will hand over to you. Thank you, James, and thank you for inviting me, and good afternoon, everyone. You can all hear me, I hope. I certainly can. Great, great. The talk today is about how law affects technical communicators. It's usually about a six or seven hour all day program, so I've tried to condense it into a much shorter time and I'll deal particularly with product liability rather than aspects like copyright, intellectual property and so on. If anything is clear, please do ask, but more generally, if you could leave questions to the end, that would be good. As James said, I am a specialist in this area. I've dealt with many cases, mainly in the UK, but other countries as well, where product, where product documentation has been an issue in legal proceedings. So typically where somebody is injured as a result of using or misusing a piece of machinery, say, and part of that problem can be traced back to the user instructions. And I've had to give expert evidence in court, but more normally in arbitration proceedings. And I'll explain the differences there. So I'll be talking about how particularly product li liability law can affect our work as communicators. But this isn't entirely negative. I think when we talk to clients, when we work to clients, having a knowledge of this area can actually add value to what we do, particularly if we're working for smaller clients who don't have particular expertise in technical communication we can add to that. Now, this mainly affects products and processes as well that have the ability to harm people in some way, physically or possibly financially as well. So we're not talking, for example, purely about software, about pure software, but about products, devices that could harm people. And some typical examples here, jet engine, piece of food packaging machinery. And I'll talk about three examples, three case studies later. A short disclaimer, as the lawyers always like to have, I'm going through this topic pretty rapidly today. I can't cover every kind of product in every jurisdiction, clearly. So while there's some good general advice in here, it won't cover everything. If you want further advice, then take specialist advice, whether from me or somebody else. What are the problems we face in this area as communicators? Well, as you all know, in reading and listening to the news, increasingly there's the what I call the culture of the victim. Somebody is injured, somebody suffers loss, and they look for somebody to blame. They seek financial redress from them, usually. When products harm, this is a video. I don't have the rights to show it, but if you ever get hold of this video, it's a really good um, example of how a company tries to do its best, makes a product, somebody's injured, and just how devastating it is for that company and its employees because they never set out to hurt anybody. They did their best, but people were still injured, suffered loss, incredibly damaging to the company concerned. People, as I said, compensation culture, these things are all wrapped up, looking for somebody to blame, whether it's a corporation or another individual, uh, the government typically as well. The law has certainly become tougher in the last 30 or 40 years in the UK, the EU and the United States in particular. 
And I think a particular problem for us as technical communicators, if we're advising manufacturers, is when the manufacturer says, well, you're saying I should put all these safety warnings on my product and safety warnings in the user instructions, but my competitor doesn't do that. They make comparable products. It just makes my product look unsafe, look unsafe. And that seems unfair. Now there are three legs to this area of law for communicators, the criminal law, civil law, and regulatory law. Now strict liability is a component of civil law. And I'll mention each of these. I'll give you some advice about writing instructions for use and the primacy of product markings. And if you take away nothing else from today, if you're dealing with equipment, product markings must come first. You cannot ignore product markings and put warnings in a manual and expect those to have any particular force. They don't. I'll speak about translation. I'll go through three case studies and I'll talk about a number of resources in this area, which may be useful to you. Sometimes when I teach in companies, some technical writers get very excited about the criminal law and they ask, could I ever be prosecuted as a technical communicator, technical author for making an error in a manual that leads unintentionally to somebody being injured? That is extremely unlikely. I've never heard of any instance of that happening in my working lifetime. The advice I've been given by lawyers is that could only happen if the technical communicator was reckless as to the consequences of his or her actions. Now that would be most unusual. If in effect they were saying, well, I don't care if people are injured, I want to get this manual written as quickly as possible and hang the consequences. In the criminal law, it says very little about technical communicators. There is some law that talks about how instructions for use are written though. Consumer protection legislation, certainly in the UK, I'll come on to that, has something to say about this area. The Health and Safety at Work Acts in the UK certainly do. In recent years in the UK, the doctrine has been developed of corporate manslaughter. Now, a corporation, a company cannot be guilty of murder, but the courts have held they can be guilty of corporate manslaughter. Manslaughter is where somebody is killed, not intending to kill them, but where the person or the corporation is reckless as to the consequences of their actions. Now, broadly, broadly, the criminal law is there to try and prevent things happening. People being stabbed, houses being robbed, that kind of thing. The civil law really is when things do go wrong to try and clear up the mess later. Regulatory law, particularly in Europe, now, you've all heard probably, or I hope you've all heard of the new approach directives in the single market of the EU, which we were once part of, and in a sense still are, because we have to meet those requirements to sell into Europe. They were attempts to set minimum standards for products and product safety, so that, for example, Italy couldn't say to a UK manufacturer, we aren't accepting your products into our market because they don't meet particular Italian specifications. If your product met the requirements of the machinery safety directive, you could sell that product throughout the EU. Now, occasionally countries messed about and tried to stop certain products being sold, but that was in contravention of EU law. And there are quite a few of these, Toy Safety Directive, um, Medical Implantable Devices Directive, and so on. They still have force in the UK through secondary legislation. 
either law or statutory instruments. Now, you've all read the government is thinking of repealing or possibly repealing some EU legislation, but I personally think it's highly unlikely that any of this legislation will be repealed in the UK. Why would they do that? As I said, the function of the civil law is to clear up the mess when something has gone wrong. In this case, when somebody has been injured or suffered loss. Now, there are a few parts to this. There's contract law. So you contract to buy a product. The law will imply terms into that contract, whether they're specific or not. In the UK, it'll imply a term of merchantability, meaning it's fit for the purpose for which it's sold. The law in the UK implies terms about it will be safe to use or as safe as reasonably practicable. That's contract law. The law of torts. Now, torts are civil wrongs, things like negligence and nuisance. The tort of negligence broadly says that we owe a duty of care to anyone who could be affected by the consequences of our actions. When we're driving on the road, uh, that kind of thing. Now, the problem with tort law, as far as products is concerned, and indeed many other areas, is that you have to show negligence. And I'll give you a simple example to illustrate why this is problematic. If I drive a car when I'm drunk and I knock you down, clearly that's negligent. You're entitled to recover very substantial damages from me or my insurer. But if I'm driving in the dark and there's a flash of lightning, a bolt of lightning, and I can't see where I'm going, that's not negligence but the result may be exactly the same, but the person gets no compensation for that whatsoever. So really in, in the United States first, then in Europe, they developed the concept of strict product liability. And I'll explain what that is. So in contract, you have all these quite complicated relationships and warranties. Strict liability, as you see, short circuits that, straight from the person who's injured back to the manufacturer, not the seller, the manufacturer, Siemens, GC, whoever it might be. Now, in strict liability, if somebody's injured by a product or possibly a process, they only have to show three things. They have to show that the product is defective. Now, defective has a particular legal meaning, which I'll explain in a moment. They have to show an injury. And they have to show a linkage in between the two. So this is the defect in the product, and it led directly or indirectly to my injury. Negligence, the intentions of the manufacturer, is no longer relevant. That's why it's called strict. It's called a strict offence. Now, what does defective mean in this context? If a product doesn't provide the safety which a user is reasonably entitled to expect, now what is reasonable is for the courts to decide. And they will take all the circumstances into account. How the product was marketed, the user documentation, any training given with the product, what's often called in UK law or English law, sorry, it's called the get up of the product, how it's shown to the world. Reasonable use of the product and foreseeable misuse. So the manufacturer and hence the technical communicator must think, how could this product be misused? Need, certainly the courts will look at warnings on the product itself. Now, the law 
doesn't expect an absolute standard of safety. And it accepts what are called residual risks. For example, it would be possible to build a car like a tank and it would be safer, but nobody would buy it. It couldn't be done at reasonable economic or performance cost, and the law accepts that. And that's residual risk, but you must warn against residual risk. I'll just say something about safety warnings before I forget. The courts have held in cases that if you plaster products and instructions with safety warnings, and some of those are trivial, it could devalue the effect of the really serious warnings. Because people look at instructions or warnings on a product and think, oh, here we go again, just warning after warning, and they don't bother reading any of them. And the courts have held that. So you warn against the main risks, not trivial risks. An example of that is a VW car manual I saw a few days ago that said, um, had a specific warning not to put your head out of the window while you're driving along. Well, I think most people know that. It's true, but it devalues other warnings in the handbook. What does this mean for us as communicators? Well, documentation is part of the product. That's what the courts have ruled. It's not a standalone item, it's part of the product. It can't make a product that's defective, not defective. If the product is defective, end of story. But it can make the product defective. Typically, that's done in my experience by people writing instructions for use, trying to be helpful and show how the product could be used for things for which it wasn't really intended. They're often trying to be helpful in that, but it can make the product defective. If say they suggest it can be used beyond its design limits. Now I've said the criminal law is unlikely to ever impact on technical communicators. Regulatory law, if companies break regulations, they might face a fine they might face their product being barred from a market or they sort themselves out. But it's unlikely to be terminal. It's the civil law where you can have huge damages for people who are injured or groups of people who are injured. That can really cost millions and even billions. And again, it's not about intent, it's about the outcome. Was the product defective? Was the person injured? And is there a link in between the two? Now I'll touch briefly on the United States. It, it's often thought the law in the United States is very different to that in Europe. That is not really the case. They are broadly similar. What is different in the United States is the way the law in which the law is administered. In the United States, they have jury trials for product liability matters. We don't have that in the UK, nor in other European countries. So you have juries deciding on damages to somebody who's being injured, who has been injured by a product. And what does the jury typically say? Ford Motor Company has acted in a terrible way will award 100 million in damages against it. That will then often go to a higher court on appeal where that could be overturned or the damages hugely reduced. So you read about these cases, but it's not mentioned that they're often overturned on appeal. In this country, if you bring an action and you'd lose that action, you have to pay your costs and of the other party. In the United States, each party pays its own costs, win or lose. Surely this is the client's problem. Well, it may be or it may not be, depending on the relationship you have with the client as a technical communicator. 
If you're working for an employer, you're fine. A vicarious liability is a concept that if somebody sues a company, they sue the company, not the employees. The employees are protected, if you like, by the company. But if you're working for a client as a self-employed communicator, the situation may be quite different. And it would tend to depend on how much expertise that company had itself. So for example, if they had a technical publications department with lots of knowledgeable, experienced people in that, then it might be less of a problem if you make a mistake. But if you're working, say, for a small manufacturer that has no technical communicators of its own and no expertise in that area, and they're coming to you because you do, then you can find yourself in difficulty if you make a mistake and that leads to damage or injury. For that reason, I'd always advise if you're advising companies in this area to have professional indemnity insurance. I certainly do. I always have had. You protect yourself by having things in writing, understandings with the client, but it also allows you to give a really good service. I've been, I've talked to companies lots of times, manufacturers, and I've said, by doing this in this way, we can help protect you as a manufacturer against product liability claims. And sadly, a lot of the work I've had over the years has been where there has been a product liability claim against a company as, and its insurers have told them to come to me to improve their documentation, their product warning, so it doesn't happen again, hopefully. If you're dealing with hazardous products, think, if I ever had to appear in court and explain why I wrote the instructions in the way I wrote them, how would that look? It's quite good discipline. Don't take work in writing instructions for use where there isn't sufficient budget. Because if you take that on and you can't do a decent job and eventually somebody is injured, that will not be a defense. You shouldn't have taken the commission. But if you act ethically and professionally, as I'm sure you all do, you shouldn't have a problem in this area if you do the right thing. Professional negligence. If we have time, I'll talk a bit more about professional negligence. But certainly as a communicator, stick to accepted standards. British standards, ISO standards, standards in documentation, stick to those. If you want to depart from those, then you need to have a good reason to do that. And you need to record it as well, because that could create a problem for you. Simplified technical English, I'll leave it to other people to talk about that. As I said, if the budget isn't enough, refuse the commission. Because if you do it for too little money, you have to scrimp and cut corners, the liability may still fall on you. Some specific advice, product markings, follow accepted standards for those, particularly ISO in Europe and other parts of the world and see in the United States. Simple rule, a symbol, an icon, should convey only one message. And the text, if you have text beneath the warning icon, should only confirm what the icon is saying and not replace it or supplement it. Physically as close as you can to the point of hazard, and you must repeat it in, this, in the instructions for use and amplify on it if need be. And I think really important, often, as you all know, the instructions for use become separated from the product itself. It's good often on the product to have an icon that says, read the manual. These are the ISO format warnings. These are examples of ANSI warnings in the United States. 
So you'll see here on the right, it's an icon that we use typically of read the manual. So it's white on blue, it's obligatory. You must look at the instructions for use. In the instructions for use, a clear section on safety. So this might be a typical contents listing for instructions for use. In red, safety, you can see it's there. And these things count for courts. Um, I've seen judges, they say, well, let me see the manual then. And it's handed up to the judge, takes his glasses off, looks at it and says, I can't make a head nor tail of this. And then often very quickly, the case goes down from that point on. Safety section, really important in a safety section for a product instructions for use is to explain things that the users of that product need to know before they use the product. Particularly important with emergency shutdown. It's no good somebody getting into a dangerous situation and then having to go and consult the manual to see how to shut the product down. They need to have that in their head. In the same way that you need to know how to stop a car before you get into difficulty. You need to know that beforehand. What it can be used for, or what it shouldn't be used for. And who reads a manual all the way through? They don't, typically. They tend to focus on the parts that relate to what they do. So each section of a manual should have reference back to the safety section. And typically I say something like, um, you must read the safety section before attempting to follow these instructions. If you don't, if there's anything you don't understand in the safety section, do not use this product. Go back to the manufacturer, supervisor, or whatever it may be in the particular contents. But you're trying to lay off risk by saying, if you're not happy with this product, if you don't feel you've been trained in it, or you don't understand the instructions, or you don't feel competent, do not use it. There's a legal principle in this country, in English law, called the assumption of risk. That if you know, if you use a product knowing in full knowledge that you're not equipped to use it, you're not trained to use it, but you still choose to, you have taken a large part of that risk upon yourself. Now, the manufacturer may still be liable, but the damages could be heavily reduced. I'd say in my long career as a technical communicator, people who write instructions for use, one of the most common things they get wrong is a confusion between descriptive text and instructional text. Descriptive is saying this button can do X, Y, or Z. Instructional text is saying press X for this to happen. I've mentioned this, so I won't leave at that point. Typical safety topics, depending, of course, on the kind of product. Good to give the user, the reader of the instructions for use, information about training that's available, support, help, videos, anything like that. Again, this is about trying to minimize risk for the manufacturer to be able to say, well, OK, the person was injured by the product, but they had all these opportunities for training, for support, for help and so on, and they didn't choose to avail themselves of those. So again, to reiterate, the product mustn't be defective. If you go in as a technical communicator to a manufacturer and you take the view that the product is defective, that really should be the end of the conversation. You cannot make a product undefective by writing a great manual with lots of warnings in it. 
but you can make a product defective through poor instructions. And I gave you an example of that. And the final point, I don't apologize for the final point. Um, I've seen over the years, people do some pretty stupid things with products. I think many of you will have heard the anecdotal tale about somebody in the United States putting a poodle into a microwave and suing the manufacturer successfully. And the story's gone around for years. The damages have grown each time I've heard the story into umpteen millions of dollars. And I researched this. It did actually happen, but there wasn't a court case. The manufacturer simply paid the claim to sum of money to go away. And that often happens in the US. It's simply easier to pay people off than to have litigation. Because just even if you win, you have to pay your own costs. Now, I think there's an argument, actually, when microwave ovens first came in, I don't remember when that was, to say, well, perhaps, perhaps that's something you could do in a microwave. You could use it for drying animals. I wouldn't do it myself, but I can see an argument for thinking that. People do daft things. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm going to look at, and you can look at this at your leisure. Uh, what text and graphics are best at. I'm going to look quickly at three case studies. One is of a medical device. You might think that the greatest risks from a CT scanner and X-ray scanner are from X-rays, from radiation. Well, of course they are, but the people using them are all trained and qualified, and they know what those dangers are. You don't have to tell them. Often the dangers here are mechanical, things flying around and hitting people in the head. In a piece of equipment similar to this one, it's not actually the equipment. We found as a firm writing the manuals for the product that it had a device that pushed down onto the patient, a kind of pudding bowl to push out the organs in their body to, to create a better visualization in the X-ray. And we said, what happens if the power fails? Oh, it jumps back up. So we tested this, didn't jump up at all. It just stayed where it was. So we said, you have a situation in the hospital, the power fails, uh, the patient's probably anxious as it is, all the lights go off, and this thing is pressing into them. That is not a good situation. And we said, this is a defective product in our view. And the manufacturer got quite cross with that. I said, look, do you want this work or not? And we said, no, we don't actually, unless you put that product right, we don't really want to be associated with that. They had to redesign a large part of that product and hold up its launch so that if the power failed, this pudding bowl type arrangement jump back up automatically, releasing the patient. Uh, broadcast TV cameras filled with gas, so you have a light touch going up and down. But if you release the catch in the wrong way, you can injure people, hit them under their chins, and let some quite serious accidents. So again, in case of product warnings there, we had to assume the manual wouldn't be with the product. It all had to be done pretty much through product warnings. Agricultural machinery sold particularly to the United States. So the instructions had to be both in English and Spanish. You had people who couldn't read or couldn't read much. But the manuals invariably would be missing. So we would have labels like this on there in English and Spanish. The important instructions had to be on the machine itself and the safety labels. So as a technical communicator, you should be thinking about the non-intuitive risks of a product. You should really be thinking all the time, what could go wrong with this product? How could somebody be injured?
Now, I said I'd talk briefly about professional negligence. Generally, as technical communicators, the more we hold ourselves out as knowing, the greater the liability can fall on our head. Now, because I advise manufacturers in this area, they're entitled to know, to think that I know what I'm talking about. And if I'm wrong, to sue me. Now, that's never happened, but they could do that. Quite a little sad case in the court in Cardiff a few years ago, where a girlfriend sued her ex-boyfriend. She'd bought a car on his advice because he held himself out as knowing about cars. We didn't know anything about cars at all. She bought the car, it was a dog, and she sued him. Quite sad in a way, but there it is. Now she won because he had held himself out as knowing about cars, not he knew about cars. That's the distinction. The test is called the Bolum test in this country. It has to be the standard of, a, of an ordinary, reasonably competent member of a profession, be it an accountant, a doctor, technical communicator, or whatever. Now we can think of two types of professionals here. We can think of, say, structural engineers. A structural engineer would design a bridge and say, this will not fall down because of the calculations that be done, the materials are used and so on. But others, a doctor can't promise a result except in quite narrow circumstances. The second, of course, in, or in this case, the first implies a higher standard. And we are saying to manufacturers, if we write instructions for your products, then that will help prevent people being injured. Now, the manufacturer, if they go to a technical communicator, they should select a competent supplier. But that may be difficult for them if they have no expertise in that area. As technical communicators working for manufacturers, particularly small manufacturers, we have the duty to spell out what to us may seem obvious, but to them may not. Particularly in talking about foreseeable misuse of products. If the budget isn't sufficient, then we should walk away from it, or at least tell the client that. If we accept it anyway, on an insufficient budget, it may still be our problem if it all goes wrong. So I would refuse that. I'm still in time, just this is most unlike me, I tend to go over. The law and the way the law is being forced is becoming ever tougher because we're more concerned all the time with victims, the culture of the victim, and somebody to blame. We insure our houses. Now, very few people have house fires these days, but we still insure our houses. These problems don't come up often. I probably dealt with about 30 product liability claims in my lifetime, um, so not very common but they are very expensive where they occur. They involve millions of pounds in legal fees, in compensation. Um, they're also very distressing for the individuals involved. I've seen technical writers give evidence in court and been crying because they never meant for anyone to be injured. They did their best, but still something went wrong. Really, if we know about this, about product liability, we can help clients, manufacturers, to reduce their liability to product liability claims. And I think we can set ourselves apart. It's added value. Right, I hope you found that interesting. I'm very happy to answer any questions.
you have. If I've run through it a bit quickly, I apologise, but please to ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to uh, take a moment just to let everyone know about next month's event uh, before we get into the, the Q&A section, but people, please feel free to uh, post your questions into chat. Um, next month, we have Anne Doherty coming to talk to us uh, about telling effective stories. Uh, so stories that actually have impact as well as being interesting. And I'm sure that will be uh, another uh, great talk. Uh, so do please sign up at Eventbrite as uh, you have done for today.